Welcome to video 7 on polynomials and factorization. This video is focused on some things called poles and zeros. So first of all, what is a pole and zero? And then we might want to ask, how do we present these in the complex plane? The video also introduces the language of left half plane and right half plane, which are very common terminology in control and therefore students need to be familiar with them. Finally, for those interested in discrete control, a very brief discussion of the unit circle. OK, the videos assume the viewer is competent in polynomial factorization, and if not, I suggest you go and look at the previous six videos in this series. What do we need then before we talk about poles and zeros? We need to use something called a transfer function. Now a transfer function is simply a function with a polynomial numerator and a polynomial denominator. So here's some simple examples. You can see g of s has got a north order polynomial in the numerator and a quadratic in the denominator. h of s has got a first order polynomial in the numerator, a quadratic in the denominator. And let's look at f down here. f has got a quadratic in the numerator and a cubic in the denominator. Now, as a small aside, if we're talking about control engineering, it's normal to assume that the denominator order is greater than or equal to the numerator order. It's not mandatory in general, but most of the examples, this will certainly be the case because in real engineering context with real transfer functions, this is what happens. So how do we define a pole and a zero? Well, the definition is very, very simple. A pole is a root of the denominator, which you remember is a polynomial, and a zero is a root of the numerator. And it's as simple as that. So let's give some examples to get you started. By the way, um, hopefully this is easy. We mark zeros with a zero. <laughs> that should be obvious. And poles, we use a cross. So here's the example. g of s equals 4 over s plus 1, s plus 2. So where are the zeros? Well, this has no zeros because the numerator is a north order polynomial. So it's got no roots. The denominator is s plus 1 times s plus 2. So you've got poles at minus 1 and minus 2. So what I'm going to do is mark these in the complex plane. There we go. Minus 1 and minus 2. And you'll notice I've used crosses because these are poles. Second example. Again, just a reminder, a pole is a root of the denominator and a zero is a root of the numerator. So we want to mark the poles and zeros of h of s in the complex plane. So first, I construct my complex plane. So here we go. I've got my real axis on the horizontal, my imaginary axis along the vertical. Now, the zeros come from the numerator. And you can see I've got a zero at minus 1, because the numerator is 4 times s plus 1. The poles come from the denominator, which is s squared plus 4s. So I've got a pole at 0, because there's a factor s, and a pole at minus 4. So now, all I need to do is mark all of these on my complex plane. So I've got a 0 here at minus 1, a pole at 0, and a pole at minus 4. So again, you notice the 0 to mark a 0, and the crosses to mark the poles. Another example. So we've got here m equals 2 times s minus 3, divided by s times s squared minus s minus 2. So this one's a little bit messier, but again, I'm just going to be calm, collected, and do things in a systematic fashion. So I draw my complex plane. There's my real axis. There's my imaginary axis. And I say, OK, where are the roots of my numerator, which are going to be called zeros? 
well that's at plus 3. Where are the roots of my denominator, which I'm going to call poles? Well clearly there's one at 0, and then you've got to factorise s squared minus s minus 2. And I can do this quickly, you may have to do this a bit more slowly. There's a pole at minus 1 and a pole at plus 2. In other words, s squared minus s minus 2 is equal to s plus 1 times s minus 2. So now I mark these in my complex plane. The 0 is at plus 3. So there we are. I need to use a circle. I nearly did a cross there. Easy mistake to make. And then the poles are at 0, minus 1 and 2. So I use crosses for those. There we go. So minus 1, 0 and 2. So there we go. That's the next example. Right, example number 4. L of s equals 2s plus 1 over s plus 3 times s squared plus 2s plus 2. Now this one's got a bit of a sting in it, but not as bad as you might think, and that will be obvious in a moment. So again, start with the simple, draw my complex plane, real and imaginary, and then say, OK, where are the zeros? So the zeros are the roots of the numerator. So I've got 0 at minus 1 from the s plus 1. The poles are the roots of the denominator. So there's clearly 1 at minus 3. Now, you've got an s squared plus 2s plus 2. You might be thinking, golly, I'm not quite sure where the roots of this are. Well, if you stick it into the quadratic formula, you'll see you get minus 1 plus or minus j. I'll let you do that um, in your own time if you can't do it by inspection. So you've got some complex roots for this quadratic factor. However, we're plotting things in the complex plane, so that gives me no problems. So I've got a 0 at minus 1. There we go. I've got a pole at minus 3. That's there. And I've got two poles at minus 1 plus or minus j. So I mark them like that. Hopefully you can begin to see the pattern. I'm not doing anything clever, just calculating the poles and zeros and plotting them in an Argand diagram. So finally, an example 5. So we'll do this a bit more quickly. We mark our complex plane, real and imaginary. And you can see I've got zeros. This time going to be at 1 plus or minus to j. Again, I'll let you prove that to yourself if you can't do it by inspection. And the poles are at 0 and plus or minus 2j. So I mark these in the argan diagram. So the 0 is at 1 plus or minus 2j. So there we go. A 0 up here and a 0 down here. The poles, 1 at the origin and 2 at plus or minus 2j. So there we go. I hope you've all got the idea by now. Um, plotting poles and zeros in a complex plane, very straightforward. You simply compute the poles and zeros and plot them. Uh, zeros with a circle and poles with a cross. So next we need to introduce some definitions. What do we mean by left half plane and right half plane? Now these definitions are as simple as they seem and they just refer to the right half plane. So anything to the right of the imaginary axis is the right half plane. So I'm going to use red here to indicate what I mean. You can see the imaginary axis. So this red shading is all to the right of the imaginary axis. And so this is called the right half plane. Anything to the left of the imaginary axis, unsurprisingly, is called the left half plane. So here we go. This blue shading over here, this is the left half plane. So those definitions are as simple as they come. Left means to the left of the imaginary axis. Right means to the right of the imaginary axis. Clearly they're half planes because they have half of the whole space. So typical problems you might get asked are how many right half plane poles does a transfer function include? So here's an example. You can see L of s equals 2s plus 1 divided by s minus 3 times s squared plus 2s plus 5. Now the first thing to notice is this question said poles. 
and therefore I do not need to consider the zeros. Next, it's asked me how many are in the right half plane. Now the right half plane is defined as being to the right of the imaginary axis, which means the real part of the root has to be positive. The imaginary part is unimportant. Okay, So the right half plane is defined solely in terms of the real parts of the roots. So all I need to do now is work out the roots and then determine which ones are, have positive real parts. So here we go. For this particular system, you can see I've got an S minus 3. Here it is, which gives me a pole at 3. And I've got an S squared plus 2S plus 5, which gives me poles at minus 1 plus or minus 2J. So if I mark these down, and these axes haven't, uh, haven't quite gone where they're supposed to go, there we go. Then I've got a 3, which is here, and a minus 1 plus or minus 2J, which are here. And the question was, how many poles are in the right half plane? And the answer is clearly just this one over here. The answer is just 1. Right, here's the second one. Second problem. How many right half planes and poles and zeros does the following transfer function include? And again we remind you that the right half plane is defined as the real part of the root being positive. Now in this case you can see that the zero or the numerator polynomials 2s minus 1 so clearly there's a 0 at plus 1 and this must be in the right half plane. The poles might be slightly less obvious but you can see the s plus 2 will give you a pole at minus 2 whereas this s squared minus 4s plus 8 will give you poles at 2 plus or minus 2j. So if I mark these then I've got my 0 here it is at, uh, at 1 I've got my pole at minus 2, and then I've got a poles at 2 plus or minus 2j. And I look back at the question, and it says, how many right half plane poles and zeros um, does the following transfer function include? And you can see there are two poles in the right half plane and one zero. So finally, to finish off, a brief discussion of the unit circle, because when you're talking about control, right half plane and left half plane are very important concepts in the continuous domain. If you go to the discrete domain, this is replaced by the unit circle. So what is the unit circle? It's precisely what it says, a circle of radius 1, which you can see plotted here. Now. The sort of question that we usually want to ask in control is are the roots, or in general terms the poles, inside or outside of the unit circle? And we're only going to make one simple observation here. A root with magnitude less than 1 must be inside because it's circle of radius 1, and a root with magnitude greater than 1 must be outside. Generally speaking, inside is good, outside is bad, but we're not going to dwell on that in this particular um, video. So, if we want to determine are the roots inside, we're basically talking about the moduli all being small. So here we go, I'm going to write down an arbitrary pole polynomial, there it is, p of s equals s plus a1 times s plus a2 all the way up to s plus an. If I multiply that out, what you notice is the last coefficient is the product of the roots, and I'm not worried about the plus and minus factor. If I assume that all of these roots are modulus less than 1, so the modulus of ai is less than 1, then you find that the product of the roots must also be less than 1. So what you have here is a necessary condition for the roots to be in the inside the unit circle is that the last coefficient of this polynomial must be modulus less than 1. However, the warning here is this is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. So just because this coefficient is less than 1 doesn't mean all the a must be less than 1. But if this last coefficient, the product of a i's, is bigger than 1, clearly at least one of the a's um, is bigger than 1.